everyone. Um, it's now 10.36 uh, a.m. over here in Fiji, six minutes past um, the scheduled start time. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, today. I recognize that we have uh, many different participants on the call from many different parts of the world um, and that uh, you come from different time zones. So while over here in Fiji, which is where I'm joining from, it's 10.30 a.m. Uh, and it's nice and, and bright and early. I know that for some others, it might be quite late into the I'm evening. So thank you for taking out the time to join us today to have this uh, discussion. We really do appreciate it. So this is an event by uh, Reverse the Trend Pacific. And in a bit, you'll hear more about uh, the work that we do from um, one of our founders, Christian. Um, but really the point of uh, today's event was that we wanted to have a panel discussion to commemorate the fact that it's the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, um, which is celebrated on the 26th of September. It was, um, the, it's the 26th of September over there in New York, where many of our speakers are joining us from. Um, and really the idea behind this was that we have a discussion about um, the injustices of, of nuclear weapons, but also the fact that we just live in a society where there are nuclear weapons, which in itself is disturbing, um, but of course made even more disturbing by the fact that there are more than 12,000 of these nuclear weapons in existence. So you're gonna hear about that and more from our wonderful lineup of speakers, who again, we'll introduce to you in, in a bit. Um, but before that happens, I'm going to hand it over now to Christian Chiobanu, who will kick us off with some uh, introductions into uh, RTT Pacific um, and today's event. Thanks, Christian. Yes, thank you, Joshua. So hi, everyone. So I just wanted to clarify that um, RTT Pacific is a chapter of Reverse the Trend, Save Our People, Save Our Planet. And Reverse the Trend, um, Joshua, if you can go to the next slide, Reverse the Trend, um, Save Our People, Save Our Planet is focused on amplifying the voices of young people who've been affected by both nuclear weapons and climate change. So we have different chapters throughout the world, um, including in the Pacific, where you know Joshua is one of our um, project um, coordinators. And we are supported by um, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, which is the um, parent organization, if you will, we're a youth in initiative of NAPF. And we have very strong partnerships, including with the Marshallese Education Initiative, the Prospectil Foundation, the ICM GLT, and you'll hear from the founder and head of that organization um, today. So as Joshua mentioned, um, today is the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, and there were discussions at the United Nations General Assembly on this topic and the importance of, the, um, of both nuclear disarmament in general, but more importantly, the, um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So many states called for, uh, many state parties, the TPNW called for um, more states, you know, including those in nuclear weapon states and nuclear allied states to really reconsider their security doctrines and to join the TPNW as soon as possible. And some states have highlighted that the TPNW is um, like a ray of hope this year, that despite the situation with the failure of the NPT review conference, the situation in the Ukraine with Russia threatening to use nuclear weapons, that the um, TPNW, especially the one first meeting of state parties, provides um, some optimism that change can happen, and that state part that states are willing to make those changes. And for us at Reverse the Trend, we're really focused on the um, ideas around the establishment of an international trust fund to help um, victims of um, nuclear tests. So on that note, um, 
I would like to introduce our esteemed um, speakers for today. We have an array of really fantastic individuals, including Demetri Hawkins from ICANN Australia, um, Mayor Tula from Y Disarm Pacific, Valley from um, who's a, um, who's going to talk about share testimony about her grandfather's experience as a veteran. We will also hear from Kasha from the Global Sunrise Project, Dr. Yale Daniele from the International Center for Multi Generation well, Legacies of Trauma, and we will also he most likely hear we may hear from um, Ambassador Sita of Kiribati. Um, right now, he's um, trying to coordinate his um, evening plans with the president of Kiribati. So on that note, we're going to um, hear from our first speaker, who will be Demity Hawkins from ICANN Australia, who will talk about why the TPNW matters in the Pacific and give an overview about ICANN Australia as well and the important work that she's involved with. So I'd like to pass the floor to Demity. Thank you so much. Bula Vanaka, everybody. Um, thank you, Christian, for that uh, introduction. And thank you, Joshua, and all at RTT Pacific for inviting me to speak here today. It's a real honor to be amongst you all. I'm sorry, Benetic and Dr. Bex will not be with us today as well. I wish them well, um, but it's wonderful to be amongst you all. I'm joining you all from Nam in Melbourne, Australia, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to the country and the people from, from these lands where we launched the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. The lands throughout what we now call or know as Australia were never ceded. I offer my deep respects to my fellow panelists and the many joining us who have been working for a world free from nuclear threats. And I remain mindful of those who've gone before us, our leaders, our guides, our ancestors, and our loved ones. As we meet today, we're commemorating, of course, the International Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And we're reflecting on mm -hmm. the enormity of that task <laughs> that has driven generations of everyday people, whether you are an activist, a policymaker, a diplomat, a medico, a student, or academic, a scientist or an artist. Where we are today, nuclear threats feel oppressive. There is a real sense of immediacy, a feeling that this work is increasingly urgent, because it is. The war in Europe, the instability in many of the nuclear armed states, the failure of the nuclear umbrella states to evolve past outdated and redundant theories of extended nuclear deterrence, new threats of nuclear testing and nuclear dumping, and the ever-present threat of outright nuclear war. All of these factors are weighing heavily on our collective sense of security today. Here in the Pacific, we have long known the reality of nuclear brutality. We have lived with and through it for far too long. For 50 years, over half a century, foreign powers came to the Pacific Islands and to the country of my birth and tested their weapons. In the colonial imagination, they saw our places as remote and unpopulated or far away. For us, and particularly for those indigenous peoples who had cared for these lands and waters for millennia, this was never the case. These were and are our homes. These are our lives. Intergenerationally, we have seen the impact on our health and on the sacred places these tests were conducted and on our own sense of human security. For me, having grown up in Australia and the Pacific in the Cold War, in a time of testing, the ever-present fear of nuclear weapons was not an abstract one. As a child in Fiji, the stories of testing on neighbors in Mohaimure were told alongside the stories of the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I learned more of the stories of Kiribati, of the Marshall Islands, and across indigenous lands here when I returned to my home country, Australia. These are the stories that led in part to our starting ICANN. These are the stories that led to the nuclear ban. It was therefore no accident that the Pacific Island nations were 10 of the first 50 to join and ratify the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which entered into force, of course, in January of last year. This treaty is groundbreaking. 
Under this treaty, the only thing you can do with nuclear weapons is get rid of them. The treaty also brings in vital support for victims or survivors of nuclear weapons use and testing and seeks to address environmental remediation. It does not shift the burden of these tasks onto the states that have been targeted by nuclear colonialism, but shares the responsibility between all states' parties. While never taking the focus from those states that have perpetrated nuclear violence, the treaty aims to build positive obligations to those people and places most affected. These commitments must be led by those who have the lived experience, assisted by those with other political, humanitarian, scientific and medical knowledges, walking together, working together. At the recent historic first meeting of states parties for this treaty held in Vienna in June, Pacific representation was outstanding. Young Pacifica people, including some who are joining us here today, were central to raising the voice of the Pacific in authentic, authoritative and unequivocal ways. That meeting ended with a powerful declaration and a serious work plan. The action plan lays out the work ahead for civil society, governments and peoples working for the abolition of nuclear weapons. There is much that I could say on the importance of the TPNW, the nuclear ban, of the need for this action plan in the face of nuclear threats, of the reasons to strive for a world free, but the Pacific knows why we need to eliminate nuclear weapons. Pacifica voices have, across generations, been essential in nuclear resistance. Pacifica peoples work hard to ensure that lived experience is understood as expertise. Lived experience is essential when seeking to address disarmament and nuclear remediation. A vital part of this is the retelling of nuclear truths to ensure that we do not lose the stories and the lessons hard learned through nuclear colonialism. Remembering and honoring our pasts and our truths helps us break silences imposed on us and prevents future harms. For us in Australia, we are conscious of how much work we have to do. Australia is where the first of the British nuclear weapons were tested. We are approaching the 70th anniversary of that first test, which took place on the 3rd of October in 1952 off the Montebello Islands, just off the Western Australian coast. A total of a dozen atmospheric tests were conducted by the British here on precious islands and deserts, all First Nations lands, fallout spreading across vast areas of these lands and waters. The fallout spread far further too, even reaching some in Fiji, at least in one case, as recorded by an important Royal Commission that was held many years ago here. In addition, hundreds of trials of toxic and radiological materials designed to further develop the British bomb took place on Anganu lands in South Australian desert country. So legacies of nuclear harm are well known here too. ICANN Australia works with indigenous community members and ambassadors, nuclear veterans and others here in Australia to seek recognition of these. While national polls show that 72 to 78% of Australians support the TPNW, the nuclear ban, we have yet to see the Australian government sign and ratify the treaty. Our new government have in indicated that they are committed to the Pacific region. They have made a commitment to building recognition of First Nations voices, expertise and influence in our parliament. They, seek, they speak of a new era of our foreign policy, our First Nations foreign policy. And importantly, we have a strong commitment built into the Labour Party's national policy platform since 2018 for this government to sign and ratify the TPNW. But we have yet to see that happen. So we have work to do, but we know we're in good company. Our friends across the Pacific and around the world can help us by reminding this new Australian government that a commitment to the treaty is central to the expectations within the region. A promise made must be kept. We have seen far too many broken promises, too many half measures in the past. We need to honour the work of generations who have stood up and defended our beautiful lands, Vanua, waters. We need to protect all people's health and safety, wherever they are in the world, and to fulfil the promise to our next generations to keep the Pacific nuclear-free and independent. So, 
on this day for the total elimination of nuclear weapons, let us renew our collective efforts to ban, abolish, and end the nuclear terror posed by the 12,700 nuclear weapons still being held by the nuclear states. Let us build together a greater dialogue, collaboration, love, respect, and peace within our region. Lunakovakalevu, Dimitri, for that incredibly powerful intervention. Um, and I'm sure that we'll have tons of questions for you after this. We do have a 10 minute Q&A session towards the end um, uh, after all of our speakers have spoken. I really, really uh, liked how you talked about the importance of us remembering our past um, and uh, in particular, the, to use that term that you use, the nuclear brutality um, of our past, because I think that's so important to um, conversations like this, and of course, in our ongoing fight for a world free of nuclear weapons. I think that's also a great segue to our next speaker, who is Viola Sulueti. Um, she's also a Fijian, um, and she's the granddaughter of a veteran, Apisai Danulamba, who served at Krismasi Island. Um, and she's going to speak a little bit about those experiences. So Viola Mbula, thank you for joining us and I'm handing the floor over to you. Mbula um, Vinaka, Governor of Joshua. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Well, thank you for having me. Um, when Mary um, approached me to come and speak on my experience about the radiation, uh, I'm very I'm very happy that I get to share my story because it was a bad. It wasn't very um, sorry. It's not known like not a lot of people know about our story. Uh, know know about what we've been through because of what happened in Christmas Island. It took us um, a while until I had my children. Uh, I have two boys who has been going through a lot because of uh, the effects of uh, radiation. Um, and with the medical system in Fiji, uh, trying to test their blood and see what kind of um, disorder they have, it was very difficult. And so, um, Every time we would go to the hospital, we have to go like uh, starting stage one. It's like we have to start all over again. And um, it was until uh, uh, December last year when they were circumcised that that was that was it. I just had to like do some more research on this radiation because they nearly lost their lives. They had to go in uh, to the hospital and go for surgery once again. And uh, that's when uh, it uh, hit our family that we really need to take this uh, issue seriously. Because uh, in Fiji, with, um, we just say, oh, we'd grow older and this would go away. But this is in us and in our generations to come. And uh, I'm willing to help any way I can to spread the word that we need to uh, work on this and stop uh, the nuclear testing in our islands. And that's, that, that, that's why I'm here. And um, I can answer questions or anything you want me to talk about other than what we've been through. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Viola. I'm sure that's that's not a an easy thing to share. I I might go ahead and ask you a question now, um, but I'm wondering, uh, did you could share with us a little bit more about what those generational impacts? Because I understand that it was your grandfather that that said Christmas Island. Um, what that sort of look at from that time to yes so my, my grandfather was in christmas island when they tested the nuclear weapons and his story 
because um, they weren't given any protective gear at all when uh, they were uh, they were only told to um, put their hands over their eyes and just cover their eyes and then he would and then he was explaining how how he could see light through the through the through his fingers how bright it was that was how big the explosive uh, the nuclear weapons were in Christmas Island and <clears throat> Upon his return, my father was conceived. He was, and and uh, we. I have an uncle who's older than my father who does not have any medical uh, uh, problems. So yeah, and wow. and, uh, for, and it was it wasn't. It's like um, it's not as much. It doesn't show much with my uncles, but with the uh, our the second generation. My all my cousins, we have we, we always have something going on with us, yeah. And uh, it's it's expensive trying to get medical help, uh, trying to get what we need, going to the hospital, not like a normal person. Um, and um, my kids cannot play a sport, contact sport, so and uh, yeah. Um, just a small bruise, they would have a high fever, or they would just get a fever out of nowhere, and we'd have to like search their body and see if they have a scratch or something. And so that's what we have to deal with. Or we'd, we'd have to take them to the hospital immediately because then the doctors would have to find out what's going on. And yeah, it's, it's not easy living with uh, a mutated gene. And yeah, and I mean, kids would like to play active sports and participate, but we just have to stop them because it could cost them their lives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for that, Viola, um, for sharing. I think that's so important because so many people don't realize, because this is something that's happened over decades, just how powerful those, those effects are they carry it down through generations. Um, and I think I really, I really like your point about how it impacts so many different facets of your life, even many decades on the, the health impacts of it. And then looking at countries like Wisconsin in the Pacific where accessing proper healthcare can sometimes be a very real challenge. The impact on the lives of children and their ability to realize all of their rights and you know, to be able to go out and play sports and enjoy their lives as children should. Um, that's such a powerful and important reminder for us all. Thank you so much for sharing that. Please stay, stick around. Okay. I'm sure we'll go back to you during the Q&A session um, for some more questions, but thank you for it. Our next speaker is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, young activist from the Pacific, someone who uh, I'm also quite proud to call my friend um, and someone who has inspired many of us who, who work in the movement and who are young people ourselves. Her name is Mere Tuilau um, and she's uh, affiliated with the very wonderful Y Disam Pacific. So we're very proud to have her uh, on the call with us and to, to be able to join us this morning. So, Bolivina um, Kamere, I'm handing the floor over to you now. Bolivina Jeshu, Bolivina everyone. Uh, thank you, Dimitri, and thank you, Vela, for sharing. Um, I I really would like to also really acknowledge Vela coming because it's been a a struggle um, and also she was trying to find the courage to come and share this morning with us. Um, she shared a bit on uh, fertility problems where uh, she had to go through before conceiving her son, her, her final sons. So that is something that um, I'm really grateful Viola for, for seeing you today and sharing and really proud of you for doing this um, for, all, uh, for all of us and for the betterment of our future generations. Um, again, Nimbula Vinaka. 
as part of this uh, International Day for the Total Elimination for Nuclear Weapons. We are reminded of the nuclear aggression and its multi-generational trauma, the testimonies of the veterans that we just heard and the community's resilience that have deepened its activism amongst youth in the Pacific and diasporas today. Just like the mat, uh, the weaving of the mat, the nuclear advocacy come a long way. It's a process. To put into context, the weaving of the mat begins with the pandemic leaf is cleaned, cooked, sun dried, after it has now been collected and rolled and stood until it's ready to be woven by the Matai's experts, who is then ready to weave in carefully the intelligence patiently. When the process of mat weaving has concluded, what we see before us is a complete mat. For the outside world, it is the complete mat that they see. Whereas for the weavers, the matais, they see the knot that holds the mat together. And this knot represents the core values that hold us together. The weavers are the guidance of the ocean who we see today as the young people. The mat is used in different ways. We use it for celebrate, to celebrate life, to solve conflict, to, di to discuss nuclear ways, or to self-determine our sovereignty. Also, it is important to note that the Matai can identify the origin of the man. The Matai is also represent the continuing mobilizing and solidarity work the youth is carrying on from our Matais. Our Met holds the stories and our ongoing struggles we have today, to name a few, self-determination, climate crisis, nuclear justice, the protection of our Blue Pacific, young people addressing corruption, banning of, banning of deep sea mining, women LGBTQI issues, young people with disabilities, policy writers, artists, entrepreneurs, etc. These are the scope of the different issues that the Pacific youth and diasporas are advocating on. It is the fabric of issues that makes the map. We see our ocean as this map. There is not enough data or mapping, or mapping scope on what the young people in the Pacific and diasporas are doing. This, this begs for more research to cover the vast and diverse issues that the MET holds, that the young people are leading. Again, to our Matais and everyone here today, it is my pleasure to be part of this synergy of dialogue on how we can continue to strengthen our advocacy and engagements in the Pacific. Nuclear, nuclear free Pacific and self-determination struggles are two issues that are close to my heart. Both these two issues represent and urge us all for a collective voice and solid action. Pacific Youth for TPNW uh, advocacy and diplomacy uh, compresses of individual uh, delegates representing Pacific grassroots and civil society organization. And the Pacific Youth for TPNW is part of a global youth movement pursuing the full extension of the UN's treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons. Also, the Pacific Youth have continued to rally the non-states and relevant state actors to contribute to the development of a potential nomadic framework and, inter and institutional 
um, architecture for humanitarian responses and environmental action of the nuclear aggression and its impact on the health, environment, and human rights uh, of the Pacific communities. Self-determination, on the other hand, in regards to the importance of self-governing of, uh, of our sovereignty, there is no easy solution to, to resolve self-determination struggles under the current SDG goals framework and the 2050 strategies of the Blue Pacific framework. Yet we all yet we all know that although the end of 2020 marked the third decade of the eradication of colonialism, there is at least six non-subgoverning territories from the Pacific listed at the UN decolonization committees. At this time, there are non-self-governing territories such as West Papua, Bougainville, and not listed uh, in the uh, UN decolonization community. Against this case of West Papua's rights to, uh, to self-determined nation is mobilizing weavers has been effective to address the grassroots and conflict while as maintaining a strong solidarity movement. Um, to conclude our collective uh, voices as Matai bags for greater engagement that goes beyond the top-down approach. The contextualization of the regional issue, such as the nuclear free Pacific and right to self-determination struggles as a bottom-up approach is critical important. As stewards, we continue to compel our collective rights of our land, our ocean, our culture and our ways of living. Our call to self-determine our safeguard and protect our narrative is ours to liberate. Vinaka. Thank you so much for that, Mere, for the powerful intervention, um, for drawing on, on, on our culture in the Pacific and in particular on the a uh, wonderful concept of that reweaving of the net. I think that was particularly beautiful, um, but also for just um, reminding us of the ongoing struggle for self-determination that um, countries around the world, but also right here in our region, our neighboring countries continue to fight for and have been fighting for for many years now. I think that's um, always an important reminder in discussions and in conversations like this. Uh, so thank you for that. Mirke. Our next speaker and the final speaker in today's lineup is a, uh, a wonderful uh, Gen Z documentary filmmaker. Um, and she's also the founder of the Global Sunrise Project, which is a youth-centered positive impact storytelling hub. And that's a lot of really wonderful words and she'll be able to explain a little bit more about it. And I think she's also even got a video to share with us. But her name is Kasha Slavna, um, and she's with the Global Sunrise Project. So Bulovinaka Kasha, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me all here with you, for having me here with you all today. I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, in Takaranto, also known as Toronto. Thank you to my fellow co-panelists for sharing your experiences and wisdom. Um, and obviously we're all here today to commemorate um, the day of to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Echo um, echoing some of the things that my panelists have said, we are in a time of multiple existential intersecting threats nuclear weapons, climate change, political fragmentation and division. In policymaking spaces, these issues have been divided into separate areas. However, they're only divided because the intrinsic links are not being understood or are being ignored altogether. They're seen as a complex interconnected web too difficult to dissect or untangle. These systems creating climate change, conflict, Wars are systems of injustice, 
their colonial systems of violence against the planet and against one another. When we are inactive on climate change, we condone and perpetuate violence against those most impacted by its effects. From the rising sea levels in the Pacific, to the flooding in Pakistan, to the droughts in Somalia. Likewise, the, well, the well-financed nuclear weapons system condones and perpetuates violence against our planet and its entire population. From uranium mining and production in sub-Saharan Saharan Africa and indigenous North American communities, to testing in Kazakhstan and Bikini Atoll and the many Pacific islands that we have heard the testimonies from. In mainstream awareness, Nuclear weapons are presumed to be a threat of the past, but as our geopolitical climate is destabilizing, nuclear weapons once again are being threatened for use on a global scale. We can't solve the climate crisis in an equitable way without framing our solutions through a lens of reducing potential conflict and addressing the threat of nuclear weapons. All of these issues combined threaten humanity's ability to meet, to meet our basic human needs and undermine the conditions to create peace. And it's clear that leaders, especially in the global north, are lacking in connection. Connection to the very personal impact of these issues on communities in the Pacific, missing connection to the land, the sea, and all living beings which sustain life on this planet, missing connection to the links between nuclear weapons and climate change, missing connection to the way that their actions will have lasting impacts for generations to come. And one of the most pressing questions we as a movement face now is how do we bridge these gaps? How do we build that connection? And how do we get leaders to truly listen to the voices of those most impacted? These narratives from the front lines of these issues are missing from mainstream media. And as a storyteller, I know that film can be a powerful tool to uplift underrepresented voices, to bridge divides, to raise awareness and to catalyze positive change. Um, so a little bit about the work that I'm currently doing is a film called 1.5 Degrees of Peace, a feature documentary exploring how militarization, nuclear weapons and conflicts are intrinsically connected with the climate crisis, which in which the film will follow the stories of young people like those we've heard from today who are most affected by the intersections of these issues. It will document their personal journeys to find solutions as they witness and experience the impacts of biodiversity loss, food and agriculture sh shortages, sorry, um, indigenous sovereignty struggles, migration, environmental racism, and the current threat of nuclear weapons. Creating balanced narratives is key and showing the challenges of young leaders in achieving climate justice, demilitarization, disarmament, and confronting systemic violence is critical, but also highlighting the joy, the collective action, and the community within these movements to inspire people to join us in our efforts. Finally, to achieve climate justice, we urgently need to eliminate nuclear weapons. Their continued existence is a threat to humanity, to our planet, and to justice and peace for all. And as we've learned today from our incredible panelists, there are leaders on the front lines across generations striving to find bold solutions, challenging the complex intersections and connections so that we can address the root causes of these issues. There is no other way to achieve climate justice and peace than to unify our movements, to learn from each other's experiences, to co-create solutions from the most localized community level all the way up to global policymaking spaces. And by bridging the gaps, connecting with one another, centering and uplifting voices from the Pacific, we can create the change that is needed. Let's imagine a future that is free from nuclear weapons, a climate that is stable and healthy, and an interconnected humanity. And let's work towards it together because it's the future we deserve. Um, I'm really excited to get to share with you the three minute trailer for my film. So I will share my screen. Um, just one moment. Peace and climate justice 
are more connected than we realize. I'm Kasia Sequoia Slavner. I'm a Gen Z documentary filmmaker and a peace and climate activist from Toronto, Canada. I've been feeling so much anxiety about climate change. Uncertain, frustrated, people are making decisions for our generation without taking our future realities into consideration. A code red for humanity released today by the United Nations paints a grim picture for our future unless we take action now. I'm on a mission to show just how closely connected peace and climate justice are. Wars, a lot of militarization are taking away budgets, but are also putting a lot of carbon emissions in the air. Through stories of youth making positive change. The and the planet, all the those who are already exposed to violence and war are those who are also most vulnerable to the extreme weather events. Movements of all kinds are pretty much single issue. They're siloed. Climate change and nuclear weapons, we have to deal with them together. And stop both clocks ticking towards our extinction. How can we turn our anxiety about these existential threats into bold action that holds leaders accountable? How can we find hope? The climate crisis isn't just about carbon dioxide emissions, it's about people. What if people were as well trained in waging peace as soldiers are in waging war? We need a peace movement to accommodate everyone because everyone's life is at stake. A community led by the most marginalized sectors of society fueled by this love for peace and love for the planet. Take small steps, baby steps. The ripple effect will be very dramatic. Each one of us is powerful beyond measure. It's my hope that these stories of courageous action ease our personal and collective anxiety, igniting us to stand together and catalyzing a unified intergenerational peace movement for the survival of our planet and all living beings. Unless we do something, we're in deep shit. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much for that, Kasha. That was so brilliant. And I see that there's a link in chat where um, audiences can learn more about the, the film and maybe even watch the documentary again, because that was such an inspiring documentary. But thank you for reminding us of the, um, of the interlinkages between climate justice and, and nu nuclear peace um, and how our movements need to come together to unify, as you've rightly said, and how we need to um, learn from each other and share those learnings. I think that's more important um, now than ever, given that these are the two greatest existential threats that we now face. Um, I'm really happy to introduce um, our next speaker. She is Dr. Yale Danieli. She's a clinical psychologist, a victimologist, a pioneer traumatologist, and a psychohistorian. Uh, and most recently, she founded the International Center for the Study, Treatment, and Prevention of Multi-Generational Legacies of Trauma. Um, she's obviously a very brilliant woman who has done, uh, who has accomplished many things in her life, and we're very honored to have her join us today. So thank you so much, Dr. Yale. The floor is yours. Thank you, Joshua. I'm very humbled and very honored to participate, especially following the young. <laughs> At my age of 82, <laughs> uh, 
you make me feel young again, which is a real blessing. I would like to reflect today, uh, uh, to begin by reflecting on what the Secretary General said this morning. He said, and I agree with him, nuclear weapons are the most destructive power ever created. They offer no security, just carnage and chaos. The elimination would be the greatest gift we could bestow on future generations. Of course, he said more, and we can say a lot more. Uh, you heard about the number of nuclear, you heard about the number of nuclear weapons we have. Just one of them could destroy at least one of our countries. Uh, and they keep uh, collecting them. Uh, so let's reflect on what that means that somehow people feel they have to keep collecting them to feel stronger than what? And the tragedy here, just as the Secretary General said, is the whole trajectory is that of destruction. It's who can destroy more in less time. And is that what we're here for? Is that what whoever your God put you on earth for? My God. Is that why the United Nations was created? When I was thinking yesterday of what I'm going to say today, basically I think about it most days, I thought maybe I should just reread the charter of the United Nations. Again, why was the United Nations created? To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And here we are again. Actually, before President Putin decided to, to attack Ukraine again and to play the, the nuclear card on top, I was feeling somewhat hopeful. Not that, like Kasha said, I wasn't feeling climate anxiety. I was, I'm terrified. Not like I wasn't feeling nuclear anxiety. I've been always terrified ever since 1945. I was here already then. But I thought that somehow we, we achieved some so sobriety and some commitment for a new world with, with, in which we will take care of the planet, in which victims do have rights and our job will simply be to fulfill these rights. Not simply, each one of us knows that it's very complex but that we will be dedicated to development, to the SDGs. We've had some good mapping of how to take care of this little, little one earth that we have. And to respect what's really important and Kasha, if you don't have it in this film, please add it. You know, we do have a resolution of the rights of future generations. This is beyond uh, the fact that each human being has all the rights we have been creating since the beginning of the United Nations, right? And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But we really specifically have rights of future generations. So every time we even give a thought to destroying the environment, to betraying the rights of future generations. We are violating our agreement with humanity. Um, I, I find myself, 
I truly find myself with this, particularly with Putin waving the nuclear threat. I'm so terrified. Here is one human being, one human being who holds in his hand the rights of our future generations. Who gave him that right? That notion terrifies me. But I, I do want to go along with, and in addition though, I did feel comforted this morning listening to the governments speaking. Most of them, albeit not those who are nuclear governments, <laughs> but most of the, at least most of the others, do see, I feel rather realistically, they see the danger and they're committed to its elimination. But, it, but uh, let me speak a little bit of what a psychohistorian is. A psychohistorian is a person who analyzes history or views history as being lived by people, not just being written you know, by dates and events, by quotes the historians, but how we, each one of us lives history. And when you speak about what I am most committed to and what my legacy is for, when we speak of multi-generational legacies of trauma, which with all the respect, I was so happy to hear Ambassador Tito mention this morning, he acknowledged that nuclear weapons create trauma. So when I speak about multi-generational legacies of trauma, let's talk, today we are speaking about nuclear uh, weapons, but we might as well have spoken about genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, crime of aggression, the environment, the abuse of power of any kind. We speak about how people live it, how even when parents don't talk about it, even if there's a total conspiracy of silence and denial in the community or the society or governments about it, people live it. They might not even know how to put it into words, but they live it in their bodies, in their minds, in their souls, in, their, in how they wake up in the morning, how they try to go to sleep at night, and how they wake up in the middle of the night terrified and not knowing why. And also being an advocate at the UN for almost five decades, or probably over five decades by now. I've also lear I've learned not only as a psychohistorian, but as a psychologist and a trauma specialist, that governments can try to deny reality as much as they want. But when you actually teach them data, teach them evidence, scientifically connected evidence, and Dimitri knows that very well, I know that, <laughs> a colleague, and I'm sorry, but Becky is not here, she's another such colleague. When we present governments with actual data, they can't as easily keep denying. So one of the reasons I'm speaking with you today, and I put it in the chat, particularly uh, with stories such as we heard today from Fiji, for example, but these stories all over the world, actually. Actually, this book, Voices from Ground Zero, uh, 
was done by a very close colleague, Lincoln Graffles. Lincoln uh, was a vet is a veteran himself. He was married twice. And the children born from both wives died of exposure-related cancers. His daughter, Patricia, was a peace activist, passionate peace activist. And I promised, I promised Lincoln that I'm going to, to dedicate my research to in her name, her and brother's name. But let me tell you a little bit about my research. Uh, I've created, in, in, when I was 70 or so, I kept getting, because of the emails, I kept getting emails. Uh, we want to study our population for our doctorates, but uh, our um, uh, advisors at the universities say that there is no measure for multi-generational legacies of trauma, so we can't do it. So I kept writing back to them. I have written everything I have to say about it. Why won't you create the measure? I forgot that in the last 50 years, the field of trauma has become so overwhelmingly rich with, with materials that for a young person to get into the field, this must be totally <laughs> und undoing. So I said, okay, so, from age 70 to 78, I worked with the best scientists around and we created the Daniele Inventory for Intergenerational Legacies of Trauma. We based it originally on studying the people I knew best, that is Nazi Holocaust survivors and their children. By the way, when I was your age about Kasha, I, I created the, the first project to help Nazi Holocaust survivors and their children. And I learned almost everything I know from them, not from my teachers, because this was not part of normal curriculum. So we created that. And when the world kept not attending to the nuclear legacies for succeeding generations. I got quite irritated. And when I get irritated, it means I'll do another study. <laughs> so a whole bunch of us, wonderful people all around the world, all the organizations that deal with veterans, with um, with victims of, uh, of exposure to test, to nuclear testing, but also uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, also nuclear bombing. We took the Daniele inventory and we fully adjusted it to the experience of nuclear bombing, one version, and to the experience of nuclear uh, 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 fallout and uh, radiation and fallout. So now we can actually study. We can study how many. We can also study what gets transformed. Now Dimitri and several of our most esteemed colleagues who are studying the genetic and the phys physiological effects are focusing on the body, on the diseases, right? We are focusing on what it's like to live with all of that. What the, is it like to live day and night with the legacy of being exposed? You heard spontaneously today, you want to let, to let the kids, to let the kids play like normal kids, you want to let them do sports, but you're frightened for them. Now, what's the message the kids get? 
either my mother doesn't want me to feel free or something like that. Or you can imagine all kinds of other meanings that children attribute to that kind of behavior, right? The point is that their worldview gets shaped by it. Not only necessarily by the, by the diagnose, medical diagnosis, but also by the kind of life they get to live. And this is where a psychohistorian <laughs> like me, <laughs> a trauma psychohistorian like me, wants to help with in this area. So I, I did write down the, uh, the link for you. Any one of you who knows children of people who had been exposed, please, we do have a measure. There is one thing, it's a fairly long study, it's a fairly long bunch of questionnaires. Why? Because life is complex. We can't summarize life in one, two, three and say goodbye, I know everything. So I, it also invites you to attend to yourself patiently and to take the time and give that time to yourself when you do that. And I promise you several things that when we get this data, number one, we will be able to tell governments more than just you're destroying. We will tell governments and decision making makers that while they make their decisions, normally with a perspective of four to eight years in mind, I mean, I mean, in non-dictatorial regimes. They don't think about the fact that the people affected will be affected for a life, lifetime. Not only, but that succeeding generations will be affected. And you know what? In every first speech that a decision maker makes, they always speak about succeeding generations. <laughs> I want them also to be committed to the sustainability and the good life, fulfilling life of succeeding generations, not just to use the phrase in their speeches. So that is from an advocacy point of view. I also am doing this study in order to help uh, the committees or based on the, the uh, TPNW for paragraph six and seven. So they know, for example, the extent to which a community needs, what are the needs of the community, right? We call it need assessment, like peace builders, right? You need to know what do you have to do in order to create peace. But for that, you have to know the reality. You can't just fly in from New York and say, you must do one, two, three, four, five, and there will be peace. No, you, you need to first know where you are. So that will help uh, very, uh, very uh, um, purposefully. So, so, so and not only of that, just to the question I am just about to say, <laughs> not only that, I was coming just back to you, Christian. Uh, the trust fund will know how much money they need based on what is really needed, right? And how to assign it, perhaps. So, uh, I'm sure I didn't say some things I wanted to, but. Thank you so much for listening. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Miel, for your comments. So I, I just wanted to take note that Ambassador Sito has, um, has joined us, and I would really love to give him the floor to talk about Kiribati's perspectives on TPNW and you know, the International Day for the Third Elimination. And Ambassador Sito, I would like to give you the floor if you are available. Well, I'm available. <laughs> Very busy time, but I am making time. 
I'm making time because I think this is a, a great opportunity, wonderful opportunity to be connected with people who, who are already converted. I don't want to. I don't. I, I, I don't want to convert people who are already converted. Otherwise, we'll be wasting our time. But I just want to inject more power and energy into those who are already on the same page as myself and the Kiribati people, the, 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 the president, the government, and the people of Kiribati. Uh, you may have uh, uh, heard what the, the, our president uh, said a few days ago, uh, you know, in his statement to the, uh, the, the 77th uh, you know, high level, uh, 77th uh, General Assembly, 77th session of the General Assembly high level week, they said. Yes, and I was uh, very happy that uh, the president did tell the world that Kiribati is 101% committed to, uh, let me use the, the American word, to fight for a world, fight for a world free of nuclear weapons. And of course, I fully support, I, of course, I agree 101% again with the president because my, my commonsensical awareness tells me that the world has uh, gone into the wrong direction. You see, I can tell you a long story, but I wouldn't uh, take too much time, but we've had a terrible experience with the nuclear weapons testing. And people are still crumpling upon this, asking the government, what can you do about us? We are now affected. We, I've lost a few uncles, a few relatives who were there on the Christmas side and when the, the nuclear testings were carried out, firstly by the British, then by the friends, the Americans, and then the jointly by the British and the Americans. And I was sad to see my uncles and aunties, you know, giving up life. They say we could be more, but we need to be referred to Fiji or somewhere else. But they could not because government at the time had that policy that if people uh, are, affect, are, are suffering from cancer, they're not entitled to fly overseas for referral. So I, I saw that, it was very painful especially those that I really love, the loved ones. And, but we're gonna do a thing because, you know, it, it goes back to maybe 40, 50 years back when they were there as young people and the testings were carried out. And without them knowing, they were told, come on, cover yourself with this tarpaulin. But you know, people, when you have fireworks, they think there was a great fireworks. It wasn't fireworks, was it? It was the, uh, the testing of the hydrogen bombs, uh, half a kilometer, one kilometer above the Christmas island. So they had to throw out the white apple in and look up into the sky. But they did not know that it was very, very damaging for them. And of course, later on, they found out that they were suffering. And they could not explain why they were suffering. They, they thought it was one of those illnesses. You know, we have illness, illness is just part of life. But then when investigations were carried out, it was found that those people were, were had, had a high incidence, high rates of cancer. So that tells us that these must have been caused by the testings. And of course, we had the British veterans, the New Zealanders, the Fijians, they, all, they also complained. But what happened? Our friends, the British, say, no, there's nothing to do with that. Maybe some other illness, maybe, you know. So up to now, the British veterans,
happens where on Christmas Island testing, we're denied this, uh, the right to be to, to government assistance. And they continue to deny it up to this point in time. And of course, I do study a little bit, a little bit of science. I study organic chemistry, molecular chemistry, DNA chemistry. I, I mean, I studied at university. So I know a bit about that. I'm not a professor, but I know that when you step the, the, the atomic structure of life, whether in the bones or in the, in, 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 in the kidney or whatever, then you're going to have problems because you are affecting nature. You're disturbing nature. Nature has made it the particular, the particular way. And if you are smart enough to destroy it, you'll, you'll face the consequences. So here we are, humanity, trying to be smarter than nature. But that, to me, I, always, I grew up in a society where we bow down to nature. Nature is represented by our ancestors. Ancestors say, they do this and don't do this. We just say, thank you, ancestors. We will follow. And that was our thinking in those days. But when we went to school, we thought we were smarter than that. Like, you know, many people I've met in the science world and the political world, they think they are in charge of everything. Well, of course, I, I'm, I don't claim that, but I've met many colleagues and I argue with them in, in, in New York and elsewhere. I say, look, come on, you're not in charge of the sun. We are not in charge of the planets moving around the sun in a particular order. We're not in charge. There's something. And even the molecules that make us what we are, just so starting from the time we are in the crucible, in the womb of our mummies. We're not, we don't know what happened. Well, just what we are is what we are. And, you know, I always say to them, look, in a factory, there are people working in a factory, making cars or making whatever. When a Honda car comes out, Honda car will come out with a Honda manual, handbook to follow. So when we were in a factory at some point in time, we came out, there must have been a manual also, a handbook. And we must follow that, whatever that is. But I believe in that. I am not saying that I'm a religious guy, but I'm just saying I'm a man. I believe in the greater being of the greater creation, the Big Bang, whatever it began somewhere. I don't know when, but some say it began somewhere. We're all part of that Big Bang. All of you, me, I'm part of that Big Bang. From the beginning of time, it was meant that we should be around at this time. And we pass on and other people will follow. So let us try and, and follow that the laws of nature, the laws of creation. Let us not try to be smarter than that. If we are creatures, we are creatures. We're not creators. And I believe I'm not a creator. I know what created me. I know my dad and mom loved each other. And then, they, and then because of love, the greatest love story they had, I'm what I am. I'm sure it's the same as we say with you. So I, I have this thinking that when we start experimenting too much with the, with the natural order, with the creation, then we're gonna face the consequences. So I'm a believer of the great, uh, the, the great beginning, which makes us what we are. Whatever is the name, uh, I don't want to name the great beginning and the, the, the great power in Joshua. And so Kiribati is, is a victim of nuclear uh, testing. And uh, we're still waiting. Who's going to help us? The president made a statement today in the, in the, uh, in, in the United Nations saying that 60 years ago, we were, no, we were victims of that. We're still victims. But then just, uh, a few months ago, when Ukraine uh, was affected by the war, the World Bank uh, declared and announced that they will allow, I think, $9 billion 
grant, not a loan. And now President say, we were affected, nothing came. How come? But now, of course, because Ukraine was having problems. Okay, we are glad, we are, we're happy that our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are being helped by the World Bank because the United States say, you know, well, I guess the United States has power what, the, what goes on in the World Bank. The president of the United States, come on, release $9 billion. Give it to Ukrainian people. That's nice. We're happy that. What about us? We don't mean much, do we? Because we're small. Because we're only 100,000 people. So there it is. We know that too much experimentation with the natural order is going to backfire on us. So let us try and, and be sensible about experimentation with, with the natural order. We're made from the natural order, the, the atoms and the arranged into molecules. And that's what we are. But we play too much games on it. They start you know, bad, you know, bouncing back. And we are victims of that bouncing back because no, that's, we were not doing experimentation. Some people did experimentation. Now the problem is, will they stop or they carry on? I find from my stay here in New York, that this experimentation is very good business, good money for some people. And of course, nowadays we do not adore and worship human life. We are sure we adore and worship money. Profit make. And that's the problem. So some of our friends here, big brothers in the big countries, they think this is the best way and the quickest way of making profit, making money. So they will not give it up unless they start investing money somewhere else. But this is good investment. If I had money, I would invest it here. If I were just money hungry, but I wouldn't because I know it'd be damaging to humanity. I would invest my money in your fish and coconut, breadfruit, something, but not in making weapons, small or large. But the problem is many of our big brothers, they're stuck with weapon company, weapon industry, weapon industry, is, is the way forward for them. And so they may talk nice in the NPC, in the UN. They talk nice, we're with you, we want to get rid of all this and one day, but deep down in their heart, no, they won't. They do the opposite. When the meeting is over, they do the opposite. And so this is a challenge, how do we overcome this? How do we overcome this? To me, I don't have the answer. I'm only putting it to you. But let's not give up. Let's continue to work hard, come together, and make sure the world's uh, mindset, the mindset of the leaders, especially in, in the big countries, who depend so much on weapon, weapon companies to, to provide jobs, to provide economy. We hope they can shift that money somewhere else and create something safer and invest their money in something which is good for all of us. So I thought I, I end there. And so all the best to you. Thank you, Christian, for inviting me. This is my piece, my contribution. Let us not give up. Let's continue to fight. OK, thank you. Yes, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'll pass the floor to um, Joshua, who will open up the, um, the Q&A. Please, Joshua. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian, and thank you very much, Ambassador, for the wonderful intervention and for reminding us of the need to respect nature and recognize um, that our survival isn't independent uh, on the survival of nature and just how interconnected we all are. Um, we've gone uh, a little over an hour now, uh, and so we just have a little bit of time for a, a Q&A. If anyone has any questions for our wonderful speakers, they're still all on the call um, and you're free to, to ask those questions if you've got any. And then we'll ask uh, Christian to wrap up our discussion for today. Um, if you've got a question, you can either raise your hands or pop it in the chat, or you can just go ahead and unmute and ask directly. It's an informal space.
I'm doing a very quick scan through the chat. And I don't see any hands raised either. Well, I, I think that we've given um, our participants a lot to think about with all of those um, wonderful interventions that were made. Uh, and I know that this session is being recorded, so there's always the opportunity um, for people to go back and, and watch that recording. So I'm going to hand over. Uh, Joshua, to there is a question. There's a question. Joanne. Oh. Joanne, yes. Yes, I was just curious because I was following along on the cities that have endorsed the treaty, but I, I haven't noticed too many cities in the Pacific area. And I just wondered if that effort is ongoing very much there. Thanks so much for that question. I'm wondering that. Oh, um, well, I think that in Australia, we have quite a number of cities who have endorsed the city's appeal here. Um, throughout the Pacific, I know people have been talking very much. I'm, I'm probably the least qualified to say much about that, Mary and, um, and Joshua, you probably have a lot more to say. Um, so I'll hand it back to you. Thanks for that, Dimitri. Did any other of the speakers wanted to add to that? I didn't hear the question, actually. <laughs> oh, Joanne, did you want to repeat the question, please? Yeah, I was, I was um, following the, the movement by uh, ICANN to be able to get cities to support the treaty. And, I, and it's now, um, I was really excited because it's now 619 cities around the world. But I, I don't see very many responses from Pacific Island countries or East Asia for that matter. And I was just wondering if, if that is an effort that's kind of more happening in the, in the Western part of the world than the Eastern part of the world. Can I try and not do answer yeah. that? Sure. sure. And thank you, thank you. you're saying that the Pacific is not coming out well on this issue. And I, I'm, I, I, I share that uh, observation because I try to get the, my Pacific colleagues to be part of the, the fight. But, uh, you know, the Pacific way is the gentle way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, good or bad, because we don't believe in, in pushing. That's the Pacific. And so, even if you are suffering as a Pacific Island, you don't believe in complaining when you suffer. Mm -hmm. You have to sort of just suffer and just be man or woman about your suffering. That's a kind of the, uh, the typical Pacific Island mindset, which, of course, is very good for our community. We don't complain too much. But when it comes to global matters, I guess we need to change our mindset a bit. But we, you know, we, 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 we'll get there somehow. I'm, I'm one of those guys who's very traditional, but also very modern, right? I belong to both. And I'm glad that I, I learned a lot about my tradition, culture in the Pacific, the Pacific way. But I've also learned about the modern ways. And so I'm able to fit in the both worlds. When I need to be a Pacific Islander in a Pacific setting, I'm very quiet and very gentle and very calm. But when in the modern world, when the global world, I'm, no, I'm a real fighter when it comes to fighting for what is need, need, need to be, need to be advanced, need to be promoted. So there it is. So I think that explains why the Pacific is not coming out of this time. Plus the fact, many of the Pacific Islands are used to the colonialism. Right? And when colonialism, you got the masters. And we kind of always say, you know, say yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, madam. And so we're still, that's part of the handbook. But I'm here in New York, trying to say, come on, let's come out, let, let, let's do something. You know, we need to, and of course there are more efforts now 
to bring the Pacific together. Just now, in a few, maybe a few days, United States bring all the Pacific Islands to Washington, a summit with Biden. The United States claim, believes that this is the way forward. We must come together. We must sign something, a joint declaration of security. It's nothing about economics, nothing about the fish, nothing about the, the coconut, nothing about the trading. It's all about security. What is security to me? Military. It's all about military. Military strategy. In case China attacks, what do we do? So, and so the United States with, with India, with Japan, with Australia, you know, whatever they call it, the Indo-Pacific, and then the oaks, you know, the, the quads, the quads mean the four corners coming together and uh, trying to bring us, but Kiribati is not there. Why? Because we think that our security doesn't belong to any, it belongs to us. We need to be working our security. So maybe sometimes we think it's bilateral. We need to work out our security with the United States, our friends around there, you China, in Japan, Australia. We're not going to be part of a, a security plan, which is developed by one country. So, so that is our thing. We, we may be doing that's with the Pacific. It's kind of uh, coming in together. We're not there because we have our own minds. We're sovereign, we're independent. So we'll pick and choose, right? Security for us means a bit, bits and pieces from around the world. And we pick and choose. We're not going to be bound by somebody's idea of our security. Mm -hmm. They meet somewhere in London or Washington and decide things and they come down to it. No, that's not the way. That was 100 years ago when they came down to the islands and say, this is your security. We, we defend you against the French, against the other Portuguese. We're the British, we love you and we want to. That was 100 years, which was except now, of course, different. So we want to operate in, the tw the, in terms of the 2020, right? But so I guess many of the Pacific Islanders are not yet up to what we are now in campus. I'm not boasting that KBS is ahead of the, we decide, our president especially, and our advisors say, no, this is the way, we're sovereign. And we decide, we decide what is best for us. How do we create our security plan? Of course, in some of the countries in, in the Pacific already have already agreed that their defense and security is with a particular country. Well, no, we are not, we are, we're free, we pick and choose a bit from China, a bit from Russia, a bit from the US, a bit from UK, a bit from whatever. But we are sovereign and we must exercise our sovereign right to decide what is, what do you think is best for our peers? I thought that, that would help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Dr. Yale, you had a question? Uh, I have a question for Ambassador Tito. How First of all, how are you today? You started my day well in your speech this morning. But you know, uh, not only um, are you serving, uh, you are extremely inspirational to the young generation. Uh, and that's a very, very important power to have for the good. Um, but I wanted to ask, do you feel in, in the UN context, do you feel that your voice is heard? Because you do take amazing initiatives. Uh. Do you feel respected by, by your fellow countries? Do you feel equal? Do you feel even sometimes a leader among them that they hear you, that they will go with you? Initially, no, they don't hear me, but now they're slowly hearing me because I'm a stubborn guy and what I believe is correct, I will push it. You see, I don't give up easily. When I think I have a good message, I will push it. So initially, I, I notice people were not listening. 
Now they're listening. Remember a few weeks ago, I said to the United Nations, you know, especially the, the nuclear powers, you guys are playing around. You say, yeah, we want to get rid of the nuclear. You say it on your lips and we fall in love with your lips. <laughs> but what you do doesn't match what you say, what comes out from your lips. Mm -hmm. Because you say, we're moving forward, get rid of the will. But what you do is the opposite. Mm -hmm. So you guys are, are bluffing. You guys are not telling the truth. You're not speaking from the heart. You're speaking from the lips. And, so you, and they keep creating new, new mechanisms. Let's do this. And this. They are all delaying a mechanism, delaying tactics. You don't want to get rid of something you really love. You go to bed with this and you love them. You hug them every night. It, the weapons are your, are, are your future. It's like the, my friend in Australia, and I'm talking about John Howard when I was with meeting as a leader of the Pacific. And when we talk about climate change, John Howard, the president, uh, John Turner would say, no, we don't want to get rid of the coal. Coal is important, which is right. Like I said, we wouldn't give up the tuna. Tuna is gold to us. And if people say, you know, get rid of the tuna, it's, it's a minute. No, 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 wait a minute. Tuna is very precious to us. I can understand when John and I say, no, I don't want to get rid of the, the coal. The coal is our future. So maybe, and the same with some of these countries. They're supposed to be very civilized and, and they're supposed to get rid of the nuclear, but they are not. They're stuck with it. Why? They cannot find any other way to invest, any other place where they can invest there to grow economically. I wish they can, because they do. Then they will just say, get rid of, no, away with the nuclear. Let's replace the nuclear economy with some other economy. So they're listening to me now because I said to them, if you behave like this, Kiribati will pull out of the NPC, you see? And everybody came to me, are you pulling out? I will recommend to my government to pull out. We're wasting our time. Let's do more creative things in the UN. It's things which will happen and not waste our time on just talking, talking, you know, beautiful talking, makes people go to sleep and dream and snore, or whatever, but really means nothing. It's all a bluff, it's all. <laughs> so I'm, they're listening to me because I, I really, I really, uh, what do you call I created, I dropped the bomb in the NPC. They're listening to me now and I'm glad they're listening. And I can talk one, use my voice. To make the, 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 to make things better for the world. Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sito. I okay. Um, we've uh, gone so, way past. Can I just? Um, so I just want to take this time just to acknowledge the the nine countries that have signed and ratified the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons in the Pacific um, for making such a bold step and also acknowledging that uh, self-determination is still a struggle in the Pacific. Um, we have uh, where territories are also downwind of, the, uh, the downwind of uh, nuclear testing in the Pacific and also those who are directly impacted with the nuclear testing that are still under colonial rules. So I'd li also like to acknowledge that the struggle for self-determination that covers this um, issue in us self-determining uh, to sign and ratify the treaties really comes down to our uh, what the grassroots is uh, wanting and what the what the colonial power is stopping us from um, from from our voices being heard and our ways to self determine um, our stance um, and also I would also like to um, acknowledge those specific countries that are yet to sign and ratify that are still in the process of really um, seeing the treaty, on the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear, we nuclear weapon on article six and seven, where it, some clauses does not really cover what they go through and they want that to be really addressed and be really, um, to be really um, collectively representing what we go through on the ground. 
So um, I really just want to um, uh, acknowledge the process of uh, what already is happening and what has uh, happened and what is on its way to 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 this positive stand in uh, ratifying the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapon, Vinaka. Thank you so much for that, um, for those acknowledgements and for just grounding us in the um, realities uh, here in the Pacific. And with those words, I'm going to hand it over now to Christian Giovanni, who will conclude our session for today. Naka Christian. Thank you so much, Joshua. Thank you, Mira, and thank you everyone for attending this event. I just wanted to highlight our website, which is RCT reversing the trend.org and also mention for those youth that are on the call, especially from the Pacific, we're actually, we have entered a very unique partnership with um, MEI, the Marshallese Educational Initiative, and we'll be launching a project in the Pacific connecting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and Human Security. So we're actually hiring two campaign managers three youth campaigners, and one social media coordinator. And this is a really exciting opportunity for Pacific um, youth to really come together and to really, you know, raise awareness about the TPNW and connect it with environmental justice as well. And I would also like to especially thank Ambassador Cito for taking the time out for, you know, for really, you know, joining us today. And I should add that um, through his work, um, Kiribati was actually appointed as the co-chair of the informal working group on Articles 6 and 7 of the TPNW that deals with victims' assistance, environmental relation, international cooperation and assistance, including the establishment of an international trust fund. And Kiribati will be spearheading that, those efforts with um, Kazakhstan. So a lot of you know really you know exciting developments you know, are coming up, and we'll keep you updated about everything. So once again, thank you everyone for joining. Perhaps we can do a group photo, please. Yes, group photo would be lovely. Yes, everyone, please turn on your cameras. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joshua, do you want to take the picture? Sure. I'm just going to give is everyone's, if you feel comfortable enough to turn on your camera, please feel free to do so. There's two um, screens, so we'll have to take um, a photo twice, if that's okay with everyone. All right. We'll take the first one now in three, two, one. And then we'll take our next one now in three. Oh. <laughs> one second. <laughs> All right, in three, two, one. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a good night. Good morning. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mother. Mother, thank you, everyone.